thanks all for uh, for coming. It's uh, uh, yeah, it's a really important kind of milestone, I think, in the general surgery uh, commitment and the residency training and what Dr. Perry is sort of advocating for, Dr. Leslie's advocating for, which is to um, put ultrasound in your training, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. As well, we have um, a number of uh, trainees here from the Peds Emergency Medicine uh, group as well, which I think is, again, a big step forward. Um, I wanted to thank uh, our faculty who are here today, Dr. Perry, Dr. Neil Merritt, who's, uh, you, I'm sure you all know, general surgeon, pediatric general surgeon with uh, interest in pediatric trauma and uh, pediatric uh, trauma ultrasound. Um, Drew Thompson, uh, one of the faculty emergency physicians. Drew, just wave to everyone. Um, who I'm sure, again, you, most of you know, faculty emergency physician, one of the ultrasound pioneers at this center br who brought ultrasound to the emergency department about six or seven years ago, I guess now it's been Drew. Um, uh, Dr. Dan Peterson, one of the fourth-year residents in emergency medicine, um, who uh, who's devoted to uh, devoted most of his fourth year to ultrasound training at this point, and will challenge uh, later this year. Will challenge for the uh, RDMS exam, which is sort of the certification of a medical sonographer, um, and uh, is quite facile with the FAS exam. Um, and apparently, I forgot Craig O'Neill on there. Uh, Craig is uh, obviously well known to you guys as well. PGY nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, general surgery, general surgery, critical care, um, and uh, uh, has long been uh, an advocate and uh, expert in the use of uh, trauma ultrasound to assess uh, for a number of uh, indications. Um, so you're well served today with a, a pretty star-studded uh, list of faculty. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Leslie, who's the program director of your program, has endorsed the support of this program. Um, this program isn't free. Um, so in the sense of the facilities and everything, that's all paid for by your program director. Same thing with the pediatric group with Dr. Lynch. And uh, Christine Ward, obviously, is uh, organizational queen and helped, uh, helped get you all here, so appreciate that. So I want to acknowledge the support of uh, our vendors, um, Sonosite, uh, who's supplying uh, a number of machines today. Uh, Jane Morris uh, is here from Sonosite. We're very grateful for um, her and her company's contribution. It's the only way these kind of uh, ultrasound sessions can happen, because we don't own eight ultrasound machines. Um, and so, and the General Electric as well has provided a number of machines today as well, um, which you'll have a chance to try different platforms because you all will leave and graduate to different centers and will use different machines. So it's important you get exposed to different ultrasound machines. And of course, the people at C Star who really are the lifeblood behind a, an event like this. Um, so we have, uh, as of a few days ago, we had 24 general surgery types and five peds emergency medicine um, uh, as well. Uh, so it's a, a nice, uh, nice group. I wanted to get a show of hands to right off the bat here. Who here in their residency, who are the general surgery residents and, you know, uh, uh, just faculty aside, who here has done a DPL in their residency training? You have? Have Yeah? Yeah. When, when did you do that? It was just once. Um, every part of for a okay. I came in. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have a, a retired general surgeon here, Dr. Bill Dunlop's in the back. He did uh, trauma training 30 years ago at Grady Hospital and... When did you finish your residency, Bill? I was 79. How, did you do DPLs in your residency? <laughs> <laughs> How many would you just say you did? I don't know. It was, it was the only way to assess. There's no ultrasound. Yeah, so you did, would you say you did more than, more than one? <laughs> for, 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 a group, for a group of 20, 24 general surgeons? Yeah, I'm sure more than 100. So, um, and obviously the Neils and, and uh, whatnot have obviously done them part of their training, but you know, I don't want the, there's still, there's still a role for this modality, which uh, may come up later in the course, but ultimately we now have a room of uh, general surgeons who do not have facility, though you all can get into the belly, you do not have the facility or the training necessarily to rapidly exclude hemoperitoneum at the bedside, because that's what that tool is for, right? And again, I have no question your ability, if you had to do one, you could get your way through it, but it's not really been part of, it's not part of the landscape. Of, of what you're being trained in. And that's obviously a bit of a gap, I think, in terms of uh, your, you know, because you're the experts in controlling surgical abdominal bleeding. And I'm not a surgeon, so, you know, surgeons here can disagree or add in as they, uh, as they see fit. But that's my impression of the, the lay of the land. So then the question is, well, how are we doing with training with other modalities? And thankfully, um, Drs. Dubois and Drs. Leslie and Dr. Perry, I don't know if those names mean anything to you guys, um, did a, uh, a very uh, helpful study a couple of years ago published in the Journal of Trauma that surveyed program directors around the country and or rather residents uh, around the, uh, the country assessing how well um, 
trauma ultrasound is being incorporated into your residency. And you know, ultimately the conclusion is that um, the situation is inadequate, which, uh, and that if you're expected to have these trauma ultrasound skills, basically more initiatives need to be made to train you in this modality. And that's what we're seeking to do here today, again with the, the support of the general surgery program, is to um, bring, narrow that gap. So you're not doing DPL, so you do have a solution to diagnose and manage hemoperitoneum at the bedside, as well as some of the other exciting applications of trauma ultrasound, hemopericardium, pneumothorax, rapid assessment of pneumothorax, and hemothorax, which we'll get into. Um, and the other thing, I, I like this uh, you know, comment, this is from Andy Kirkpatrick, who's, I'm sure many of you know his name, he's one of the leading trauma guys out west, and a big ultrasound enthusiast, and in his Trauma uh, Association of Canada address, his concluding comment I thought was really great, because if you just want to encapsulate part of the value of ultrasound, it says, you know, if the essence of our calling is being at the bedside when needed, should we not collectively embrace anything that improves the bedside care of the critically ill and improves our initial examination of them? And it's a tool that brings you to the bedside of these patients. It doesn't bring you to the pan scan at the, at the PAC station. It brings you to the bedside to assess them readily for these problems. And I think it's, it, for that alone is a, is a tool that, um, that uh, is, is worth its weight in gold. So the learning objectives, because this is, uh, you know, this is, you must have learning objectives. So at the end of this half-day course, you will understand the value of trauma ultrasound across a number of life-threatening conditions. Apply new skills in image acquisition, image interpretation, and clinical integration, which are the three pillars of point-of-care ultrasound usage across a variety of trauma ultrasound applications. And you'll be able to appreciate the role of ongoing mentorship and supervision to acquire proficiency and competency in trauma ultrasound. You're not going to leave here competent today, but you're going to have the, the tools necessary to get there.